And now let's take a step back from the channel tunnel and just talk in general terms um, about fire development in large tunnels. This is not nothing new. This is based on something that uh, Professor Ingerson presented at the, the Catastrophic Tunnel Fires uh, Conference in Boros uh, back in 2003. Uh, where you talked about how fire de fires develop and how fire spreads along a queue of vehicles in a tunnel. We assume there is um, some part of the, the, the rolling stock, or in this case, or in uh, a tunnel, some, something burning is producing a fire plume. Now, the fire may have be spreading. It will generally spread in the direction of ventilation flow, so it may have, there may be a zone that's burned out upstream. There may be a zone that's still hot but isn't doing much burning. Most of the combustion happens in one localised area. Um, and we see as you go along the, the, the tunnel, uh, there's, it reaches a maximum temperature somewhere in the combustion zone. And also, because there's a lot of combustion happening, the oxygen concentration drops across that combustion zone. Leaving the scenario where downstream of the fire, there is a zone of high temperature but low oxygen, um, where the vehicles are exposed to high radiative heat from the, the fire plume. They're producing gaseous fuel, uh, but there's no oxygen. Uh, and so we have an excess fuel zone here that if oxygen was introduced, it would burn. Um, and there may be a yet further zone further downstream, where we'll call a preheating zone. But in this zone here, I want you to think that there is potentially a, a, a zone of hot, unburned gaseous fuel. And the question I would like to happen is, what happens to that hot, unburned gaseous fuel? At some point, it will mix with fresh air. It may happen kilometers away, depending on the, the configuration, or it may happen close to the, the, the fire location. Eventually, it'll mix with fresh air, and one of three things will happen. If it's hot enough, it'll auto-ignite and burn vigorously. Uh, if the conditions are right, or as you might say, if the conditions are wrong, uh, that could lead to uh, some kind of explosive event, uh, not unlike backdraft. Um, whether that's ever happened is another matter. Uh, if this gas is slightly cooler, it would mix with the air, but it might not ignite immediately. But if it encountered a fire elsewhere, a pilot flame, uh, then there could be some secondary burning uh, some distance away from the fire. Or it might just be simply cooled and diluted sufficiently to blow away uh, and not, propose, not pose a hazard to anyone. And the main question I want to ask here is what if the ventilation conditions in the tunnel change? Because in each of the incidents that happened in the, fire, the, the channel tunnel, the ventilation was never constant, it was always changing. In 2006, the ventilation flow as experienced by the fire um, would have been something like this. It's very approximate, but when the train was at normal running speed, the, the air flow across the train is approximately 19 meters a second. When the fire was uh, detected, uh, the driver was told to slow down, but not stop yet. Um, and so he slowed down so that the effective airflow ventilation would have reduced to about 12, 30 meters a second. Um, and during that time, in the 2006 incident, uh, the emergency ventilation, the supplementary ventilation system, as it's known in the Channel Tunnel, was, was started. Um, so that when the, fire, the train was eventually signaled to stop, uh, it came to a stop and it experienced the, the emergency ventilation, which is about three meters a second. And so in 2006, the fire only ever saw a diminishing airflow. In 1996, uh, the graph would have gone something a bit more like that. In that instance, the train was stopped uh, several minutes before the uh, ventilation system was effective. Um, indeed, there was a period of about 20 minutes when the um, fire was, uh, the, the ventilation system hadn't been set correctly, there were problems with it. Uh, and so there was quite a while um, before the, the emergency ventilation system was, was activated. And so what the fire saw then uh, was as the train stopped, the, the fire experienced a reversal of flow. The flow in the tunnel due to the piston effect would have kept moving even when the train had stopped. So it would be coming from the rear of the train for a while, then it would damp down to ambient, and then when the ventilation started, uh, the, the ventilation again reversed, uh, and so the, uh, it would see a second reversal in flow. And very much the same happened in 2008, although the period of uh, minimal flow was, was much shorter. So what happens when the train is in, in motion? Very high air flow. Um, there is actually no um, fire spread happens at one street, downstream only, but there's no excess fuel zone, like in the standard picture that we saw a minute ago. Fire growth and spread are very slow due to the cooling effect of the air, and also at high velocities, the, the flames will be, will be shorter. As the train slows down, 
you might find that the airflow is reduced, you might find that the excess fuel zone uh, starts to be generated in the downstream side of the fire. So that's possible. But then the train stops, the ventilation reverses. What had been the excess fuel zone now gets an inflow of fresh air. So there's a potential for rapid fire spread on that side of the fire. It also generates a new uh, excess fuel zone on the other side. Um, and so we've got fire spreading in both directions here now. So when you change the ventilation again, again you get the same effect. Uh, you get uh, rapid fire spread, this time in what we call the upstream direction, uh, and continuing fire spread in the downstream direction. So when we consider the, the channel tunnel fires, initially when the train was in motion, the ventilation was about 90 meters a second in that direction. What we had was possibly slow fire spread from wherever the, the fire started in the direction towards the rear of the train. When the train slowed, slowed down a bit, the fire spread would have continued in that direction, may even have speeded up as the train slowed down, uh, it's hard to tell. But when the train stopped, the ventilation reversed, all of a sudden we get rapid fire spread in the downstream direction and we start to get some fire spread in the upstream direction which wasn't possible before uh, due to the, the high airflow velocities. And then when the emergency ventilation started, um, again, the, the, fire, uh, the ventilation direction changes, the, the upstream fire is inflamed, the downstream fire uh, is established again, uh, and that is probably the main reason, in my opinion, why uh, in both the 1996 and 2008 fires, uh, the fire grew to be very large before the fire brigade got there, simply because of these reversals in flow uh, in the tunnel. And so I have three simple conclusions, recommendations at the end, um, and I must put a disclaimer on there. Much of this analysis is speculation. Um, I have not fully validated in any way the assertions I'm about to make um, by detailed research, but I do hope to do this in the future. Uh, and I have a research proposal uh, that I'm trying to write at the moment to, to get funding to, to look at this uh, in some more detail. But my three recommendations for the Channel Tunnel and for other similar uh, tunnels like it would be if it, if it is necessary to stop the train in the tunnel, then the emergency ventilation system should be activated and allowed to become fully established before the train is signaled to stop. This will mean that the train will never experience a reversal in ventilation direction. If a train on fire is stopped in the tunnel and is subject to a longitudinal airflow, I think that the airflow velocity should not be increased after the fire has become established because that's only going to um, cause the fire to grow rapidly uh, and create more problems uh, for the fire brigade when they get there. And finally, consideration should be given to drive the train out, train out of the tunnel before stopping. That was the original uh, plan in the Channel Tunnel. Uh, as far as I know, in none of the three incidents that have happened, was there a good reason why that shouldn't have been possible? Um, according to my understanding of the fire dynamics, the fire would still have been a manageable size by the time it was out the other side and the fire brigade could have dealt with it out of the tunnel. Um, and also I just note in passing that fire growth is slowest when the train is moving fast. Uh, so certainly consideration should be given just to keep the train moving uh, rather than stop in the tunnel where the firefighters don't want to go anyway. So thank you for listening. I'd also like to thank uh, the uh, Rail Accident Investigation Bureau who, in the UK uh, who invited me to be part of the, the UK's investigation in, into this fire. I'm sorry I'm not allowed to say more because uh, the publication, the joint publication between the, the French and the, uh, and the British has yet to be published. Uh, but I, I'd like to acknowledge them and I'd also like to thank you uh, for your attention and I'll welcome any questions. Thank you.